For me, it was really incredible to empower Black voices and to put out a show that was so unapologetic in its boldness. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, not every show can do that. I strive for versatility. So like I look at Swarm and I, I look at it like a child. It's like my wild haired, blood faced <laughs> child that I like love. And I just like sent her off into the world and I'm so proud of her. And I'm, I, I can't wait to see how she is in five years, but it right. Swarm was the middle of my TV writing career because I had been doing this for 10 years at that point. Right. But it's the beginning of me standing on the foundation that I've learned from working with other storytellers and gaining the tools that I need to understand that this is my purpose. Mm-hmm. And I'm really proud of the fact that like it was like a black led experience and that we just were like really proud and bold and Dominique was incredible and yeah you know she's just she's like a gift you know and to work with someone that talented was one of the highlights of my life and you just want to you get a taste of that and you're just like this is this is this is what it is this is the purpose Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman is a podcast on directing for anybody that's quite simply ever watched anything. Visit PeteChapman.com to get your official podcast merch, hoodies, hats, jackets, mugs, and other swag, and learn more about your host. Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman is sponsored by the good folks at Scriptation. Scriptation is the Emmy award-winning app for production that allows you to mark up scripts, transfer notes, generate breakdowns, and so much more. No matter where you fall on the call sheet, Scriptation makes it easy to go paperless, collaborate with your crew, and save hours of time. Go to Scriptation.com forward slash Pete to learn more and receive a special offer exclusive to Let's Shoot listeners. Now, on to the show. Welcome to episode 66 of the show. This is Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman. And today's guest is the writer, producer, showrunner, Janine Neighbors. Janine is an amazing writer with an incredibly diverse resume across multiple genres. Her credits include Atlanta, Swarm, Watchmen, Unreal, Girlfriend's Guide to Divorce, Dietland, and more. Y'all are in for a good one, folks. Uh, catch up. I actually ran into Janine a couple days ago on the Fox lot as I was wrapping up my Friday prep on High Potential. I've got one day left before we start shooting on Tuesday, so by the time this episode airs, we will be on our second day of shooting. It's been all the proverbial meetings that I've talked about on this show, but I guess the thing that I will share from this particular process is how rewarding the cast Zooms have been. On every show, where possible, I try and have a 10 to 15 minute Zoom scheduled by the second AD with each actor so I can get a little digital FaceTime before we show up on set and I'm the guy walking up yelling action or with a note or a thought or a nice job or whatever it might be. This was something that I began doing during COVID, particularly because of the social distancing and the added kind of personal disconnect of having on a mask and oftentimes a face shield in the beginning. And so I wanted to make sure that they got to meet the director as a human being. So it's been great. And it's on this particular show, it's been a great addition to the prep process as I make sure to talk about the episode, answer any questions that I can. I also like to check in with each actor and see how they like to work. TV production moves incredibly fast. So if I can learn anything about their process before getting to set, what kind of notes best move the needle for creative results, as an example, or whether or not someone likes to go first in their coverage, that can really make a difference as to my ability to deliver the episode I've envisioned during prep. So I got to chat with Caitlin Olson, who I've worked with before on Always Sunny, Daniel Sunjata, who I realized we probably head nodded at each other in the elevators of NYU many years ago when I was an undergrad and he was in grad. 
Judy Reyes, who's a good friend of director Keith Powell, another friend of the show here. Dennis Actinez, who I worked with on <clears throat> Flight Attendant. And then Javicia Leslie, who I'm just meeting and it was a pleasure to meet and talk to. So I'm really looking forward to diving in with all of them and making a hell of an episode of High Potential. In the ongoing saga that is our heist film that I purposefully leave the title out of it until we get further down the line and also think it's a great title, don't want to buy a ticket. But um, in the ongoing saga of our heist film, on Friday, I chatted with our deck designer, Michael Reynolds, who is in Portugal. Shout out to WhatsApp. I was able to hop on the phone or hop on my phone, I guess, via the app at about 7 a.m. and talk to him in Portugal. And I sent him a copy of all the various slides in the document. Uh, I talked about themes and moments, references, anything that might spark a creative idea in him for the magic that he does with a presentation. And what I'm really excited about is that he pitched me on the approach of using GIFs within the document. So it doesn't just feel like a, 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 a kind of paper, you know, slide to slide, page to page deal, but more of a cinematic document where the GIF images give you more of a feel of a movie. So very excited about that and checking out what he's able to deliver. And maybe at another point, I'll talk more about making a deck, whether for a pitch, for a show or a pilot or whatever. But I think that's a really important way to elevate who you are and your vision and show your passion and eliminate questions. So note to self, I will talk about that in more uh, detail down the line. I'm going to write that down right now. So now, crew call. Crew call. Let's get to this week's crew call. We've got Adrian Acevedo, love it, talking about the life of an independent filmmaker. Here we go. Hello, my name is Adrian Acevedo Lovett. I am an independent filmmaker, specifically a director, writer, producer, and actor. I think it's important to shine a light on us indie filmmakers because we do wear a lot of crew hats. So I basically build a film from the ground up. We come up with an idea that we're passionate about. We write the script. We find investors. We crowdfund if need be. And then we go right into pre-production and we are doing kind of the same kind of stuff the big production companies and films do. We find more crew, we get contracts going, we get permits going, we find locations and all the nitty gritty. And at the same time as a director, while I'm doing that, I'm also creating a shot list, talking to my cinematographer and having meetings and making sure that we have a clear vision of our film. And once we're in principal photography and everyone's in place, uh, it's just about time management and getting the vision across and working as a team. And I'm really big on working as a team like a family. And then in the post-production process, I'm actually the editor. So I usually edit on Premiere. And then I have a small post-production group of people that I work with on a constant basis. And we submit to festivals and we plan out our festival run and the festivals that we feel would benefit the project. So it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. And we're wearing many hats. And sometimes I'm not just a director, writer, producer, actor. Sometimes I'm crafty. Sometimes I am a PA myself. And as an independent filmmaker, we are a big and small crew, right? Like we're all wearing multiple hats. <laughs> but in general, yeah, I think it's really important to shine a light on indie filmmakers and the amount that we do as crew. So thank you. Thank you, Adrian. And yes, it is a lot. Independent filmmaking is many hats. And for me, I was having a chat with about this earlier today. It's something I'm very proud to have navigated and experienced. And uh, I will make another independent film. I love, I love the the process. But I, I feel, I feel blessed to have gone through that because I feel it makes me a stronger storyteller on the television shows that I direct, where I have more resources, but I don't always have the time. And so going into that indie toolkit has proven to be a great way for me to get what is needed on the page in a in an economical fashion with a and I feel like I'm maybe tooting my own horn, but with a high, a high level of creativity, I will say that. So 
For anyone else that's interested in submitting a crew call video, go ahead and make a two minute video explaining what you do and your position on set. Shoot it in landscape mode and email it to let's shoot with Pete Chapman at gmail.com and we will work to get it on the show and or on our socials. Now, let's get to it. This is episode 66 starring Janine Neighbors. Roll sound. Speed. The interview. Take one. All right, Janine, welcome to Let's Shoot with me. We are just saying my own name in the title. <laughs> now, I know I want to thank you because I know you're in the room right now. We're, we're going to talk between beautiful episode structure and season layout. Can you, can you mention what you're working on or is it a, a top secret thing at this moment? Uh, it's a little bit of a, a top secret thing, but it's with Onyx and it's really exciting. And hopefully it, it's, a, it's a kind of like a mini room right now and hoping to find out if it gets greenlit within the next few weeks. So awesome. It's very we'll, exciting. We'll get into like the journey, but since we are right here right now, like what is it that, and without the specifics, but like in a, as far as a framework, like what is happening in that room and yeah. how do you, how do you move through that process and what's the goal? You know, it's, every room is different. They're like children. Every show is like, a, it's like a different organism, you know, and yeah. this show is, is a thriller. It's a, it's a very much a thriller. And so you're, there's a lot of moving parts to it. The room was assembled with people who are more higher level writers. That was very purposeful in this regard because we don't have a lot of time to break the story. And, and you need writers who have a lens for a brain for thriller, for mm. like thriller structure, which again is like a very different type of animal when you're really looking at shows, especially a limited series, because this show is eight half hour episodes. And it, and so it's going to, it's going to lend itself and you, you, you have to take a really big swing and, and mm. stick the landing and you only have one season to do it. You only have one shot. Right. <laughs> so, right. So There's right no now, recalibrating. Like, no. And so, and so this has been, it's been like a really, I've never broken story this way, honestly, because you, you, when you, we came into this room with two episodes and the pilot is, it's, you know, you're setting up so much in a pilot. And so just, there's just so many moving parts. So like with every episode that you break, you have to go back in a way to assemble, to kind of like put those Easter eggs into the pilot in a way mm -hmm. that you just don't have to do with other shows that I've worked on that are like, you know, just not not entirely kind of in, intertwined together, kind of right. in, a, in like a very kind of, I would say, pot boiler. Right. Like new way. idea, new ideas did not merit returning to make sure that they were like paid off yes. because it's yes. it's now that's episode three we, exactly yeah because yeah, these you know <clears throat> some some stories you just it's like a it's it's a ride and like it and this is definitely a ride but you have to you have to go back and kind of recalibrate the the automobile at which you're mm. riding in this story mm -hmm. If that makes that, any sense. No, it, it makes perfect sense. Like I, yeah. I am, I don't fancy myself a writer. I'm more of a, of a writer of things for me to direct, which I kind of, yeah, yeah. and maybe that's my own, I don't know, issue, but I, I view what we do different, but like mm -hmm. we're, I just recognize that we needed a new scene one in this feature because we just kept getting notes and notes and notes. And like you try and hear what's under the note and I was like, you know what? We just changed the first scene and we can set all of the threads and the dominoes up that kind of prepare people to have the questions that we're getting. And then yes. we can answer them much the same way we already have because they'll already be thinking it's a question. And it's yeah. it's weird that you like, it took so damn long to fucking realize that, but that, but, what are, but that that's what it is, right? The feature that you're working on is it? What what's the genre? It's a heist. 
Oh, so there you go. Yeah. That's very similar with, you know, cause it's, it's, they're puzzle pieces and, right. and, and, and the story, the story is, is a puzzle. The, pu- mm. the, the story that we're working on right now. And it is, it, and it's the most incredible minds in a room, just like, <laughs> you know, picking away at a picture and then trying to re- put it back together. But it's a, it's, it's going to be a picture you recognize, but it's going to be mm. a completely different face. Right. So I, it's like, you know, yeah. I love it. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm excited yeah. that just yeah. from what you're saying alone, it sounds <laughs> like dope. Well, before, you know, Unreal and what else do we have? Swarm and Atlanta and Watchmen and all of your things. You were a young girl from Houston. Houston. And Te- so Tejas. Tejas. So let's Tejas. let's go back there. Like how did yeah. you what was your what 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 was your introduction to the idea of of pursuing a career in in, mm-hmm. in story or even just enjoying story, you know? Yeah. It's interesting. I I was an athlete. I come from a family of athletes. My cousin actually was just drafted into the NFL. He was like the number six pick, Malik Neighbors. I come from like down south. I've Gabe Neighbors is my is my football playing cousin. Like we are Mm-hmm. very much an athletic family. So I wanted to be a professional track runner. That was my goal. Mm. That's what I thought I would do. And, you know, when you're a professional track runner, you're kind of retired by, you know, <laughs> mid to <laughs> mid to late twenties. So I, that was my trajectory. And I, I was injured when I was teen and that kind of, and my dad got cancer at that time. And it, it just kind of derailed a lot of things for me and in a good way because I ended up taking a theater class and that theater class kind of opened it like broke my brain Mm. and allowed me to kind of really see that my entire life I had always been someone who was very like imaginative and like like really appreciated the art of story Mm -hmm. you know my my parents are also both like really good storytellers. I mean, they're not artists, but they were just like really captivating when telling mm-hmm. stories. And I think when you grow up in a in a house like that, and my brother and sister were teenagers when I was born. So like there was just a lot of stories of them before me and me right. before I knew who I was. And and so there's one yeah, stick out so to you, you right could, now, like that, like if I said what do you, what story do you remember? Like, well, what was like, what were we like always kicking around the house or at every holiday where you're like, will you chill with that story? Like, <laughs> the story, the story. Oh my God. I mean, there were so, so many stories. There were so many stories. I mean, my, my mom is one of like n- nine or 11. My dad was one of like six, but then he had like a whole other, you know, all these other siblings. So he was te- technically one of 12. So like, it was just like, the stories are just endless. They're endless, you know? And I think, I think I was just, I was just really drawn to, to, to that. I wish I could remember a story right now. My brain mm-hmm. is kind of broken, but. <laughs> You're in thriller mode. So I, I, that <laughs> is fair. In thriller mode, yeah. Yeah. But I will say that. So yeah, so that was, that was definitely something. And going into theater was, it was just, it was like a light bulb went off and I was able to then take that and, and, and focus that into college. I went to Ithaca college as a a BA, you know, theater major. And from there, was that a direct mm -hmm. route from that first class after the track injury? Like you, you you recognized immediately, like, yeah, I kind of caught the bug. I caught the bug. Right. And so I was just, you know, I was, I was obsessed and my parents were like, who is this child? But they were so supportive, you know? And, Mm. and so I think, so yeah, so the last like two years, you know, from sophomore, junior, senior year, like that was just, I was like on the, you know, the theater nerd bandwagon. (laughs) And, (laughs) And then I got into And then I got into theater school and it was just more nerdy shit, you know, where you're just like breathing on the floor and crawling like a bug and, you know, to sit in silent silence on adult, you know, doing all those like dumb exercises and, 
you know, it didn't feel like college because we were right. literally just hanging out and 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 like reading Shakespeare. Were you, were you like, <laughs> I, I need to, I really need some snow and cold weather in my life. Like, how did you pick Ithaca? I picked Ithaca. I think I, I read, I read the Odyssey mm -hmm. and I love that book. And I, I don't know, there's something about the name Ithaca that was so interesting to me, but I, I also just heard that it was like an incredible theater school. But I wanted to be in, I, I wanted to be either in California or New York and, you know, it's upstate New York. And I just, I don't know, I just really wanted to go there. Yeah. Just something felt, it felt like a, like a calling. But then I got there and it was like, there was zero black people, you know, <laughs> and it's cold as fuck. Well. It's cold as hell. You know, uh -huh. kids would get drunk and like freeze to death, you know, like. It was, it was crazy. It was crazy. Right. And I was just like, what am I doing here? But I ended up like really after, after some time, I really kind of, I, I was in it, but right. it took a while. It was and, de definitely a culture shock. And, and when you get, when you have a theater focus, is it like, I guess really explain that to me. Is it like, is it inclusive of acting and writing and like like everything or do you like really focus in on a particular yeah. part of the craft no it is it is it, it was everything they made you they made us act they made us direct they made us write they made us you know like you're it's kind of like you're the undecided mm. but you're like i'm i'm undecided but i'm a theater nerd so that's literally the route of which that took. yeah yeah and then and through that, I, you know, I, first it was, it was acting and I was like, oh, maybe I want to be an actress. And then I was like, I absolutely don't want to be an actress. And then it was mm. like directing, which is still something that I, I love, you know, but the writing kind of took over and, and by my senior year, I had written a play and I was pretty determined to go to grad, to, to continue Mm -hmm. on with school and to do that kind of graduate playwriting program. Because at that time, you know, that was a while ago. At that time, that was really what people were doing. Right. You know, I wouldn't, you know, now I think it's so different. Like you, because you realize how, like the schools have just gotten so ridiculously expensive. And, you know, to put, to go to like, three art schools ultimately, which is what I did because I right. did, I did undergrad and then I did this playwriting program and then Juilliard, which was a fellowship. I mean, they pay you something right. to go there, but you know, that's just, you can't, you can't do that today. It's expensive. It's, it's, it's so expensive. And it's, it's so expensive. It's so expensive. Like you would, you're just in so much debt. Right. Which is what I, I was in debt until literally which, a few months ago. Which really puts you in such a, yeah. a relaxed place for creativity. Yeah. There's nothing like yeah. <laughs> nothing yeah. like debt. Exactly. Now, <laughs> was was there well, I'll say for me, like going to film school, like back when I went, there was no other option to really have a safe cocoon through which under which to create. You know, mm -hmm. like what did did it offer a similar a similar it kind did. of yeah. It did because like, I, I don't know, like being, going, growing up in Texas and in, in Houston, it's really diverse now. It's really diverse. The food is great. But when I was younger, it didn't feel, <laughs> it didn't feel very diverse to me. Yeah. You know, I had my family in Louisiana that we would go, go visit like every weekend. And like, that was, that was like the black of my life you know like that was like the roots of my of who I was as a person right. and I ha I lived in a black neighborhood but you know it just felt there there was just you know I don't know like te the ideology of Texas then was just it, it was still there was racism you know yeah. like it's like a real thing and I you don't really under you don't really know how to process like racism as a kid until it like literally tries to kill you, which is what, <laughs> you yeah. know, like it, it's just like in your face, but you do also don't process how like the a system or the, the, the structure around you 
and just like hates women, you know, like all of those things, like the misogyny, like all like, so you're growing up in like a place where, you know, it's like, that is where, you know, husbands order for their wives, you know, and you look at that and you see that and you see that growing up and it's, it's weird. Right. Right. And so you, and then you go, you, you're, you're in like a theater space and you're like able to like read plays or read, you know, talk to people and you're, you're learning so much about emotion and feelings and microaggressions and all of those things that you don't have the words for when you're Right. 13 years old because you're just like and you know like a nerd trying to figure out like you know what's going on but right it's but yeah I, th- I think it was a safe space to kind of explore and to ask questions and to like oh uh, and to learn who I was having been born there and understanding that like the place that you're raised in doesn't necessarily have to and in, it informs you to a point and then you kind of make a choice and you, under, right. you know, and you learn more about yourself and kind of move forward. And like art obviously allows you to give you, it gives you a, a voice. It gives you a filter. Right. So, so I feel like I was like, I was born in Houston and raised in New York. I say that to everyone. Mm-hmm. I was raised because I moved to New York when I was, when I was 17 and I lived there until I was 31. 30, 30, mm-hmm. you know? So like, I'm just like, this, is, are, that, this is my that, life. Those are the real formative years, especially <laughs> yeah. as an artist, right? Like anything totally. you do as an, in, in this business, it's like, there's before I was hustling, trying right. to do this. And then there's right. when I started hustling, trying to do this. Right. And that's, and that's when the growth occurs. Exactly. You said like, uh, I'm going to miss the verbatim, but like, you kind of find out who you are. Who 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 were you in the Juilliard Fellowship versus, you know, the Janine in the MFA and BFA program? Like, was there a, was there a demarcation in terms of like your growth and like what you were trying to say that happened when you got to that third program? Well, Juilliard is it's interesting because like I'm sure people were like, why? You know, you say, oh, I went to three schools. You're like, why would you do that? And of course, I think it's like, I do not advise that for anyone, but the Juilliard program was, it was like the, it was, it's one of the hardest programs to get into in the world, just full stop. And if you apply and you get in, you go, right? And so it was this thing where I was like, and I was at a point in my life where I left my graduate program. I came out. And I got an award right after my graduate school. I I was, I I had a play published, you know, that was like very rare and that happened. And so I, you know, I, I was, I was in it, but I also like, I didn't have a lot of money. <laughs> you know, I was living with three other girls in Washington Heights. I had to like, I had to live, I, I you know, New York, it wasn't as expensive as it is now, but it was still so pricey. So even though you're writing and you have a play that's published and you're like in all of these really exclusive writing groups in New York, you're not being paid, you know, you still have to make your money. You still have to make your ends meet. So like my life had to supplement my art at some point Mm -hmm. because I wasn't in school for, there were two years where I was like, you know, and like Juilliard was like, we'll give you a little money. And it's two classes. It's like one, it's one class a week and then another class every other week. So it's not that many classes, right? right that you're, that you're committed to, but it's right. a lot of writing and you have to show up and you have to like, you ha- just have to be present. And so for me, it was really hard. I think my first year to be entirely present because I was still in that mode of like hustle in New York. You know, like I, I broke through that academic thing and then I was like hustling in New York and I had like seven jobs and I was like, and then it was like Juilliard and I have this class I'll have to go to. And, and so, and then it was, it was just a lot of, and so I remember, you know, at some point like Marsha Norman, who I love more than anything and Christopher Durang, who just passed away and he was, he was so incredible. And I remember them just kind of sitting me down and being like, you're so talented. <laughs> Mm. But like, you, like, are you okay? And I think that was the moment where I was like, I have to like, 
I have to be okay. I can't, I can't, I can't waste away this opportunity because I'm so, I'm so busy hustling right. and trying to make a life. So then I remember very consciously taking out a loan mm. so that I didn't have to work as much so that I could really just focus on Juilliard. And that was like a lot, you know, I already had debt. Right. But I was like, you know what? I have to, I can't, I can't mess this up because I'm one of like four people that have, have been selected out of like thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And I have to give everything to this program, you know? And, and that was when it kind of clicked for me and it became, I was, I, I finally realized that like, oh, this is what it feels like to be like a rich kid, you know, cause you don't, mm. you just have a cushion and right. you can be like, okay, I, I took out this like loan, right. you know, and I, and even though I have all these other loans, but I took out, I took out my own loan. Like my parents have nothing to do with it. My, you know, this is me as an adult, like trying to like subsidize my artistic career, mm -hmm. which is what I had to do. You know, and you, had, you had to meet the moment. You know, like yes. that's the, yes. that's always, the, I had to meet the moment. That's exactly what it was. Part. Like, you know yeah. what the moment is and yeah. it doesn't matter like whether you've got all the things that you wish you had or you should yeah. have or whatever. It's yeah. like, you know, that's the unfortunate thing of getting into this business and not having the safety net. You have to, yeah. you have to meet it, moment after moment after moment under great duress, financial yeah. and psychological and still find a way to create. So absolutely. And then I remember I got my first therapist and it was like, yeah. Woo, she was like a black woman. You know, I was, I was like, oh. it was just, it was just like, you know, that moment where everything just like, you're like, Oh, this is mm -hmm. who I am. And, da, 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 and you know, that stuff. So it was and great. So, so how did you, what did you, was there a mandate that you produce something, I guess, a, and then B like, what did you leave the program with? Yeah, I I left the program with uh, a play that I think that I I I think it's an incredible play for me, and it won a a very very prestigious award. I was the first black woman to win win this award at the time, and that was that was huge. Mm -hmm. But I had to I couldn't get that unless I like rec you know I did the the work to be like I need to like not be this crazy person that's running around New York trying to like nanny for like 10,000 <laughs> white ladies. <laughs> well, also like, I mean, that's literally my first year of Juilliard. This is an interesting story. I, there are only so many classes. I had this assistant job. This woman was breaking up with this, this woman that I worked for. She had a business in France and she had a business in New York. And she realized that her French boyfriend, she did not speak French. Uh -huh. Her French boyfriend had been kind of like stealing some of her money from her business that was in France. And Yikes. so she was like, I, I need you to fly to France, pack up my five cats and break up with my boyfriend. <laughs> and so I, I literally had to go to these in, wait, iconic- Wait, 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 in French? <laughs> No, I, oh, yeah. I, I do not speak French, but she was like, I can't do this. He's hurt me. Mm -hmm. You're my assistant. Like, and, and she, she came eventually, but like, I had to do this. I had to do the dirty work. Right. And so I go to these two iconic, like playwriting symbols that are like the legend, the legends that they are. And I'm like, I have to miss a class. And you're not, you know, you miss a class when like you're dead. Right. Or someone right. else is dead. Right? right. And I was like, I kind of, I kind of got to go to France to break up with this woman's boyfriend and bring back her five cats. And they were like, that's incredible. That's a story. <laughs> go. But like, are you okay? You know what I mean? Right. Like that moment. So, so again, that was, that was, that was like, it's like it's like we're laying down the foundation to like really be selfish and take care of yourself yeah. before yeah. anything else. 
So how do you get into the, in the world of television? Did you have your sights on that? Was it, you know, I have another director guest that I was just chatting with who, actually writer, uh, writer and director, but more writer who was like, you know, I got to go to TV because I'm not getting paid in this film world. Like, what was the, what was the, how did, how did you put your sights on that? It's interesting. I had always really, really loved TV. And one of the rituals that I had with my dad when I was a kid was I loved, I loved British comedies. Like I love Mr. Bean. I loved hmm. the Tracy Altman show. I loved it. And, it. and those shows were so, you know, they weren't meant for kids, you know? And, but I just, I loved the humor. And so my dad made a deal, you know, he was just like, okay, you can watch this with me. And so, so that was kind of the ritual that we did. And, you know, the Tracy Altman show also had, before the Simpsons were the Simpsons, they were on yeah. the Tracy Ullman yeah. show. Yeah. And so, so that was kind of the deal that we made. He was like, okay, you can watch the show. You can watch the Simpsons. And then after the Simpsons segment, you go to bed. And so mm-hmm. that was kind of like the thing. And I, I don't know. It always felt like something otherworldly. Like, it's like, what is this? What I'm, I'm a black girl from Texas. There weren't, film classes not at the time I mean obviously Austin is what it is now but like when I was a kid Austin was not what it is now Austin is like hype now but it wasn't that and so you know it's not like there was anything that I could like really strive for from Texas so New York always felt like a stepping stool or stepping stone towards LA but when Again, when I was in New York years ago, playwrights writing for TV was very, very taboo. It was like Mm -hmm. you would be like people would like literally throw up, throw your play on the ground. Like they would like spit on it. Like they were like, oh, you're a sellout. It was like you're a sellout, you're a sellout. And when I was at Juilliard, there was a rule. It was like if you sell a show, if you go to L.A., like you and you attempt to do TV, we will kick you out of this program. Like it was very, very like people got kicked out for doing that. That is not the case anymore. That is definitely not the case anymore. You have kids at Juilliard now that have like sold 40 shows, you know, but, and are running whatever. But at the time it was like, absolutely not. And so you're a little bit in, you're like a creative bird in the cage. If you're at the time, like really wanting to get to TV. So Mm -hmm. I graduated from Juilliard. I had, I had this really incredible, you know, thing happen where this play serial blackface that I wrote won this prestigious award. And then I had this other play, Annie Boss is Missing, that had a premiere at Steppenwolf. And so those kind of Mm -hmm. lined up around the same time. And Marty Noxon, who was my first boss in... TV read one of my plays and she, and I got that interview from, from the play. She was one of the few people at the time that were reading plays right? and didn't require a sample to, to staff as a staff writer. And, and so it happened really quickly. And I remember I was, I was, I was working for a family that I adore. They're really sweet, but you know, I, it was three, teenage kids and it was you know like getting them home feeding them making sure that they're like doing their homework and they're not like making out with whomever in their room <laughs> and that they're like actually eating and not like you know like all the all of the stuff like you, it right. was like it was like I was like the surrogate parent to these three kids and then and then the parents would travel or come home but I like made sure that the kids were all whatever and I remember mm-hmm. getting the call being like you got to you got the job. And right. I was washing dishes and I was like, I'm not going to finish. And I literally was like, I'm moving to LA in five days. Right. Peace. You know? And it was just like, did, I'm, did, you, I'm did you turn the water off? I, you know. I turned, I, <laughs> now, wait, now what, what show was this for? This is for a girlfriend's guide to divorce. Gotcha. Hi, my name is Asia Naomi King from Lessons in Chemistry, and you are watching Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman. Transitions, a 
director's journey and motivational handbook is Pete Chapman's book from Michael Weezy Productions. The reviews are in. Greg Berlanti says, there's a reason why everyone who works with Pete falls in love with his work. The lessons he imparts here are invaluable. Do yourself a favor and read it cover to cover. From Sarah Gamble, Pete's sharing gold nuggets that will spare you a ton of wasted time and help you channel your drive, talent, and ambition in the most productive way. And from Jesse Williams, this business has everything to do with preparation and expectations. Transitions grounds lessons in reality while empowering our artistry to run free. Not an easy balance to execute. Transitions, a director's journey and motivational handbook is available on Amazon and anywhere else you get your books. Don't forget about your mom and pop shops, people. Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman is sponsored by the good folks at Scriptation. Scriptation is the Emmy award-winning app for production that allows you to mark up scripts, transfer notes, generate breakdowns, and so much more. Personally, I use Scriptation daily on every production that I'm involved with. While directing episode 106 of ABC's High Potential, I was able to take advantage of Scriptation's new tagging feature to keep track of the many elements layered into my episode. Morgan, played by Caitlin Olson, experiences visions that offer an alternate take on what the police think they know as a case develops, and these interesting pops are full of new information, wardrobe, props, stunts, etc., that require a heightened level of organization to realize your director's vision. This is just one of the ways I use the incredible features inside of Scriptation. Go to scriptation.com forward slash Pete to get an exclusive 20% off Scriptation's premium toolkit, Scriptation Industry Pro. So that happened first, and then it was Unreal, and then it was Dietland. And then it was Dietland. All of those are Martin Auction shows. So she yeah. took me, she carried me through three three of her shows, you know? And yeah. I was on Girlfriend's Guide for five seasons. I was on Unreal for one season, and, and Dietland was only one season. But, you know, it was it was really great because she was, she's someone who was like, Editing is important. Being mm -hmm. on set is important. Like there, there was a philosophy with her, with with that, and with her, and that philosophy has just gone out the window now. Like there are so many people who've been in so many rooms who've never been on a set, yeah, who don't know how to edit episodes, who yeah. don't know how to talk to, you know, and it and it's. It's really, really, really interesting. And I think Man, so. I, in, I, I, interesting yeah. is an interesting word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause it's, yeah. it's, yeah. I, I see it from, you know, I mean, everybody, the, this system of the assembly line we're all on works best when people are aware that is, it is kind of, in fact, a creative assembly line, you know, and, and if you are unaware of all the levers, you know, you know, like one of the pet peeves I have is, is, folks who haven't been on set, like maybe they're getting in your ear about something like on the master shot. And it's like, we're not even there. Like, you know, like great note, but like, we're going to get there and get it. But like that actor is not really even keying into anything just yet there. But, right. you know, when you're, right. when you haven't been on set or like, if you haven't, you know, it's a challenge for the new director. If you haven't directed before, it's learning like how to kind of, you know, they say like, you can't, control the horse until you can control yourself, you know? And like, mm. until you know, like, just the rhythms of everything that's going to be coming at you, you might like respond poorly, you know? So it's like, oh, yeah. it's so valuable yeah. to like, just watch and see how it works. Because I can imagine you saw a whole lot of shit that you uh, put to great use now as a showrunner. Yeah, I mean, you're just dropped in in it. You know, and it's just, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. And I love that I learned it in those three shows. Well, the first two shows were in Canada. And so mm -hmm. Canadians are just so nice. <laughs> you know, even the line producers were sweet, even though they were hard asses, they were still like nice, right. you know? Right. And, and so there's, a, there's like a respect. And I remember being on, like on, the set for Girlfriend's Guide and like the lead actress being like, 
you're never going to see another set like this. Like this is an mm. incredible set. Like this is an anomaly. Like you just, mm. because people really will treat you and treat women and, you know, just like, like, you know, like dookie. Yeah. And so it was, it was really great to be respected as a writer on set before, you know, it, that was, it was awesome. It right. was awesome because it, that doesn't, that's not my, other people I know who were coming up with me as staff writers. That's not their experience at all. Mm. How would you at describe all. your style if you had to? Style of? Of, of, of writing or, or the things that you're, mm. or thematically attracted to. I'm really attracted to, things that people stories that people don't necessarily want to tell or are afraid mm -hmm. of telling I think that that is if you look at my plays or just the stuff that I I'm currently working on in TV and the shows that are in that are being made currently that's def, that's definitely what it is I think it's like mm -hmm. subverting an idea of 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 what you think a black character of mm. how they should be presented in the world with, you know, with like an artistic lens and with, I think the integrity of just, this is at, at its, at its core, there is, there's a truth there. And if you actually like sit back and allow yourself to see what the story is, you'll see, you'll see what that truth is, you know? Yeah. What show do you think your sensibilities began to most align with the show? You mean in in shows that I've seen that I've been fans of? Friend, shows that shows that you that you've written on or for or created. Oh, interesting. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's interesting. I I do. I think every show that I've been on, with the exception of probably one, aligns with some sensibility that I have. Mm -hmm. You know, I think. There's a part of yourself, if you, if you really want to write, you have to, you have to have a, a view of yourself in the things that you're working on. You mm -hmm. know, you can't just like be this person who's like, I don't connect to these characters at all. And I'm, and so therefore I'm just going to like take this check and run. There are some writers that do that, but I can't, I'm not that person because you know if you come up as a playwright where a, a work is singularly yours right you know you realize how hard it is for someone those stories are not that they're precious but those those stories come from a place of purpose and right. so you want to honor other people's purpose when they're telling stories whether it be plays or a TV show. So I always, I always approach it with a respect, you know, mm -hmm. but the respect has to be mutual. This is a business where people will just decide that you are not right or you're this or you're that and write you off. And, and, and yeah, that, that's going to happen. But at the end of the day, like I just, it's, it's, to me, it's very, it's very important to like, to approach people with a level of, of respect and like, okay, tell me what you need. I'm here. I, I want to service your story. You've hired me for a reason. You know, I'm here for a reason. Like what, what do you need from me? Right. right. To help better your story. And, and 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 that's what it is. And that's what it is. And so I think for me, my approach, my style is really, it's about finding writers who are who are kind of cut from the same cloth in this in in the sense of just understanding what the formula of TV is and understanding mm -hmm. what like there's a trope to certain characters and just like how can we how can we like kind of break that or bend it or show it from a different side right. so that we can like 
Yeah. So that we can like really just fundamentally like want to fuck with the story, you know? <laughs> right. right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> just fundamentally. You know I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like I right. fundamentally want to like, yeah, I just like, I'm, I like, I, w- I want to figure the story out. Like this right. is cool. This is fun. This is, this is exciting. This is scary. This is whatever, whatever word you want to use. Like you just mm-hmm. like, you want to do the work. There's so many writers that just want to like yap and just like, it, you know, it's like, just do the work. Yeah. Show up yeah. and do the work or find another job, I guess. So I want to, I, I feel like with, with folks of your caliber sharing their time to chat with me, I, this is a new question because I don't, I feel like I'd be remiss by trying to design it. But like, mm. what, if you could like spend a few minutes talking about some part of the craft that is most important to you or that is, you know, overlooked or mm. that people should put more time into, like, what would that be? And just like as a as a alley oop, like for if somebody were to ask me that, I would always say blocking. Like it doesn't mm-hmm. matter. Like like if you can't block, you can't you can't shoot it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then also blocking can get you out of some challenging situations if you know how to mm-hmm. take advantage of it and maximize camera placement, but keep the, but keep the frame interesting by where the people move. So you know, mm-hmm. as a writer, like what what would you wax poetic on if given that platform right now there's a couple of things i think it's like looking at the story in a holistic way and like i understand that there are like moments that excite people and there are like things that you might see online or things that you might read and you're like oh this is that's cool like but like really allowing yourself like my approach to writing is it's it's a little bit like an athlete. Like this is mm. not it's not a it's not a race. Like this is not a okay, let me just like take two days and like throw shit on the, the paper and like and like and then yeah. give it to someone. Like it's like it's not a competition. I think there's a lot of people who are very, and and I and I get it, especially as uh, being a black person in this industry that are pitted against each other and and it becomes a race it becomes competitive it becomes like you lose sight of what your actual purpose or passion is Mm -hmm. and I think I think you have to really you have to really meditate on a story that you are trying to tell because it, it, if it's not working, it doesn't mean that it's it's not going to work. You might just have to like, you just have to do the work. Sometimes you have to do the work on yourself. And sometimes you have to do the work in, by watching other people's work or reading other people's work. And sometimes you just have to do the work by like being like, okay, this thing is not working. I'm going to take a step back and I'm going to come back. And like, it, beca- it needs to become like a ritual. It needs to become, mm-hmm. there has to be a purpose to it. Because if it's just, I'm trying to sell this movie, I'm trying to attach this actor, I'm going to go on Instagram and I'm going to see that this person just sold this and da 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 and, and now I'm mad and now I'm going to tweet about it and subtweet that person and then now I'm going to like, you know, <laughs> like, it's just like, it's like sometimes you just have to like block out the no- noise and like yeah. find find your meditative space because that is the thing that I think will ground you and it will empower you and it will give you Hmm. and I it will give you the strength to to really understand what you're trying to say and what you're trying to do as a storyteller and again like even with comedy there's something people are trying to say you know Oh yeah. <laughs> Even when and this is, and this is not, you know, this is not like being preachy or trying to, fl- you know, hit people over the head with like, with, with any real meaning. It's just like, I think if you, you leveling up as a writer and becoming, 
especially in the in the place that this business is right is is in right now, which is like it's really hard. It's really hard to sell something. Yeah. It's really hard to staff. It's really hard to be seen. It's really hard to like stand out. And I think all of those things fall kind of into you looking at yourself and being like, okay, what do I have to offer? And what are the stories that I want to tell? And if this is a story that is so hard or so uh, like, you know, it's just, it's going to take a lot of time or it's going to take a lot Mm -hmm. of resources that you go for it, you know, just do it. And, and I think, I think we've, you know, just to t- try not to lose sight of like actually doing the work. Cause we live in a society right now where we can have anything instantly. I'm, I want ice cream. Okay. I can have it in 20 Boom. minutes. Right. You right. know, I want water. I can, I can, you know, like I can, I want like Fiji water or I don't know. I yeah. want like alkaline water, al- alkaline water or whatever. Like you're just like, you're just like anything you can just get so quickly. And I think, right. I think sometimes that, messes up your brain when you're creative because you're like, oh, this isn't working. I have to like yeah. put this away or you can microwave like, everything, but, yes. but farm, farming has gone out the window. Yes. Like tending to a crop. Yes. And, yeah. Yes. This just popped into my head because I feel like my assumption is that you move through the world kind of with such a with, with story at your fingertip fingertips. Do you ever look at yourself as a story (laughs) if that like 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 when you look like do you look at yourself and say like you know janine is the main character in this shit right here and like she wants to tell this story or do this thing or make this pivot and i need to i might have my own personal challenges but knowing story i know what i need to do so i'm gonna push myself to do the thing that i would push a character to do like does it ever fold over into your own life I never really think of it like that. I always see my life in chapters, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, this is the chapter of like, this is like the chapter of life. Mm -hmm. I I have a kid. He's going to be two soon. You know, it's like, you're in this, it's, you're giving life to, you're giving life to your marriage. You're giving life to your child. You're giving life to story. Mm-hmm. You know, you're bringing, you're bring, you're giving life to other writers who need jobs. And you're like, I want to, I want to help you. I want to give you a job, you know, like this feels, and, and it, it is a version of leveling up, right? It's hard to see myself as a character in a story because you're changing so much. And, and I feel like I'm a pretty boring person, honestly, <laughs> because Not I feel true. like I'm just like, <laughs> I just feel like I'm like always working you know what I mean like there's like it's like where is life you know like where's life where's life you know but it's yeah I I I guess in that sense because I see my life in chapters I do Mm -hmm. I guess it is a story it Mm -hmm. is definitely a story I just I I just never thought of it that way it's really interesting yeah yeah that just popped into my mind yeah we're we're rounding third here and and time is ticking away I do feel like I'd love to hear your I was going to say postmortem, <laughs> but yeah. then that, that feels like not the best word, but you probably know what I mean. Like, like, what do you, what's your takeaway from the swarm experience, right? Like so yeah. many accolades, like, and postmortem sounds like a negative kind of thing, but I mean, like, really like, what did you gain and learn? And like, how are you fulfilled? Like, what do you take away from, from that? Such a unique show that found its audience probably when I feel people might've thought that it might not. Yeah. I think the takeaway is you, for me, it, it, it was really incredible to, to empower black voices and to put out a show that was so unapologetic in its boldness. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, not every show can do that and not every, and I don't, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm a, I'm like my, I strive for versatility. So like I look at Swarm and I, I look at it like a child. It's like my wild haired, 
blood faced <laughs> child that I like love and I just like sent her off into the world and I'm so proud of her and I'm I, I can't wait to see how she is in five years. But it right. it you know, it's 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 the beginning. That's what that's my takeaway from Swarm. Mm. Swarm was Swarm was the again, the middle of my the middle of my TV writing career because I had been doing this for 10 years at that point. Right. But it's the beginning of of me standing on the foundation that I've learned from working with other storytellers and and gaining the tools that I need to understand that this is my purpose mm-hmm. and 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 now it's just it's just it's just onward right but i i'm really proud of the fact that like it was like a black black led experience and that we just were like really really proud and bold and and we and dominique was incredible and yeah you know she's just she's like a gift you know and to work with someone that talented was and is one of the one of the highlights of my life. And you just want to you get a taste of that and you're just like, this is this is this is what it is. This is the purpose. Yeah. You know? How can we recreate this over yeah. and over again with yeah. different ideas? Well, my last question is specifically for writers. What three characteristics would you say are best to have in your cap to make it in this industry as a writer? Oh wow. Best characteristics. I would say have a sense of humor. Don't take yourself too seriously. I would say don't assume mm. that you know anyone in this business mm. because mm. that is not, you, you just have to take people as they are and under, know yourself and that is it. That's who you know. You know you. That's it. You know you. You know you. Because this right. business will. And I I think you you pay it forward. Mm-hmm. There are people that you're going to meet. And again, it's like this weird assumption. You're If someone is an assistant or if someone is, you know, like you just treat people the way you want to be treated. Yeah. Because you just, you never know what one bad day might, what, you know, your, your reaction to someone might lead. It will be like a domino effect of, of different things. Right. And I think that that happens a lot, especially when you're coming into this industry, because you're just like, you know, you're like, I don't know who this is. I'm going to try to gussy up with this person who's like, Mm -hmm. you know, and you just have to like, again, this is not a race it's not it's not you know this is a it's a very long life it's a very long life as a a a writer in this business because it's the ebb and flow and it changes and you just treat people with respect but also know that you need to be treated with respect as well well on that note (laughs) thank you janine i really appreciate you hopping on this interview in the middle of your work day while trying to figure out how to scare the hell out of some people <laughs> and break <laughs> break new ground in the genre. Yeah. But I appreciate it. So, yeah, this is awesome, Pete. It's so good to see you. Thank you for allowing me to have this conversation with you. You too. And I feel like I, I know you. I, I now know you better than I did before. So that, that is amazing. Yeah. Nice. All right. Amazing. What's up, people? This is Pete Chapman. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter via at Pete Chapman. Follow the pod on IG via at Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman and hit up our mailbag with questions, suggestions, or hey, donations if you're feeling like it via Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman at gmail.com. And just in case you need to know how to spell it, that's Pete with the last name C-H-A-T-M-O-N. Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman is produced and edited by the multi-talented cut creator Tristan Nash. Assistant produced by the young mogul Jada George and features the wonderfully gifted Kelly McCreary as our announcer. 
It's written by yours truly, but I mostly come up with these questions on the fly, which you've probably noticed. Go ahead and get your podcast swag via PeteChapman.com and leave a review on iTunes if so inclined. That shit matters. Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman is sponsored by Scriptation. Scriptation makes it easy to go paperless on set, increase your productivity, and save hours of time. Let's Shoot listeners get a special discount on Scriptation Industry Pro. Go to scriptation.com forward slash Pete to learn more. All right. Thanks for listening, y'all. Next week, join us for a special actors roundtable with the cast of Netflix's hit series, Dead Boy Detectives. We'll be talking with George Rextrew, Cassius Nelson, and Yuyu Kitamura. And in the meantime, stay safe, spread love, and keep creating.